Chapter 2, Fort Snelling. They didn't have uniforms for him. There was a pair of black pants that were so short his calves showed, a pair of gray socks and a black felt hat. That was the uniform he received to go for a soldier. The socks and pants were stout, but the hat was cheap. And with the first little sprinkle, it sagged around his head and drooped over his face. They took his name. The colonel of the regiment read a list of things he couldn't do. Desert his post, traffic with the enemy, steal from his fellow soldiers, act immoral or without decency. And then he signed his name, told them he was 18 and they didn't challenge it. And he was a soldier. He could read and write, Charlie could, Though he hadn't had much schooling, his ma had made him stick to reading and writing, and he wrote her letters telling her of how it was to be a soldier. The food is bad, he wrote. Beef so gamey, dogs won't eat it. And hard beans. We buy all the beans and use them for a meal, then use the leftover beans for soup the next day, and on the third day, Take any cooked beans that are left, dry them and crush them and boil them for coffee. The men don't like them much and there's talk of hanging the commissary officer. It ain't but just talk, but some don't smile when they say it. There wasn't much of a war, Charlie decided early on, but there was a lot of play acting and once he got inside it, he found it mostly boring. They did something they called drills and the manual of arms. Working in the hot sun in the compound area of Fort Snelling until they were soaked with sweat and Charlie felt he could snap his rifle from left shoulder heft to right shoulder heft as good as any man in any army had ever done it. They fired some, but there wasn't much ammunition and when the sergeants tried to make them hit targets a quarter mile off, Charlie nearly laughed. He'd hunted his whole life and knew about shooting, but the rifles they were issued were 58 caliber rifled muskets that fired a hollow base bullet called a mini ball, named after the Frenchman who had invented it. The rifles thundered, but lacked the flat crack of his smaller bore hunting rifle, and he found that nearly a third of the time the bullet seemed to fly end over end, and it was all he could do to hit a target 50 yards off. A quarter mile over 400 yards seemed silly. But they practiced anyway, and stood and fired and dropped to one knee, and then the next rank stood and fired and dropped. They reloaded by biting the end off the paper cartridge, pouring the powder down the bore and setting the bullet on the powder with the ramrod. Then a cap on the nipple, the hammer back and fire again. They said a man could do it three times a minute, but Charlie somehow never managed more than twice. When they couldn't afford to expend any more live ammunition, they practiced with empty rifles again and again until Charlie was sick to death of the drilling and wheeling and marching and fake loading. It would be different, he thought, if the leaders knew what they were doing, but the officers and sergeants had been civilians like the rest of the men and mostly had been elected by the men themselves and had to learn as they went along using an army manual for close order drill. It seemed all they did was drill and sweat and listen to sergeants and corporals bellow at them. And as the weeks passed, Charlie grew more and more bored and was beginning to pay attention to his mother's letters. She had taken to thinking of the bad side of the war and was in fear that Charlie would get killed and wrote three times a week. I know it ain't right, she wrote in one letter, but you must think on coming home now. 
Just leave the army and walk home before they get you in a battle and shoot you apart. Like most of the men, Charlie doubted there ever would be a battle. Minnesota was mostly wild then, with Sioux and Chippewa Indians to the north and west. And there were some frontier forts on the edge of the wilderness to deal with any difficulties. These posts were manned by regular army troops, which Lincoln needed now to fight in the war. And there was talk in the ranks that the Minnesota volunteers would be used to replace the army troops at the frontier forts so the regular army could go east to fight. It'll be all mosquitoes and muck, a corporal named Massey said during a break in drilling one afternoon. They don't let me go fight the rebels and I might pull foot and leave. It was all rumor, of course, but what with his mother's letters, she wrote more often all the time of deserting, the boredom of constant drilling in the hot sun, and now the talk of being sent to relieve the frontier forts so that the regular army troops could go fight the rebels. One company had already been started on the march north to the forts. Charlie was nearly on the edge of leaving when on June 22nd, they were called into formation, ordered to get all their gear and marched to the river where steamboats were waiting to take them to St. Paul. There, they marched through town with great fanfare they still didn't have proper uniforms, but they had all been issued red flannel shirts. And though those shirts were as hot as original sin, as Charlie heard them described, at least the men looked like a unit, marching with shouldered rifles and hats cocked forward. Girls waved flags and people yelled, Go it, boys! Get the rebels! And... Don't stop till you hit Richmond. In a short time, they boarded other steamboats that took them south and east to La Crosse, Wisconsin, where trains were waiting for them. It was all new to him. Charlie had never ridden on a steamboat, never marched in a parade, or had pretty girls wave flags for him and hand him sweets. Now, as he boarded the train, and saw the plush seats and fancy inside of the car, he thought, I never, I just never imagined such a thing existed. It was, all in all, a simply grand way to go off to fight a war. <laughs>